you know, um, we've been asked to wear these things to protect us from COVID-19 or coronavirus. I go out of the house every day because I have to feel protected. I don this mask. I put on gloves when I'm at work because I am an essential worker. And somehow I, I guess I feel safe. But what I don't understand is when I take off this mask, I don't feel safe. Actually, I don't feel safe even with the mask on. Because the one thing that I cannot take off is my race. I cannot take off my blackness. I can't paint it on. I can't take it off. My blackness is exactly who I am. And I'm very proud of that. Isn't it weird? As a black man, I can't jog without getting shot. As a black man, I can't shop without being followed. As a black man, I can't drive without being racially profiled. Back in the day when I was in my early 20s, I went to Six Flags with some friends. As a matter of fact, I went to Six Flags with uh, a really good friend of mine, her younger cousin, and my little brother. We had a great time, you know, Six Flags Eureka, you know. Uh, about an hour from St. Louis. And, uh, you know, just, I'm in my early 20s. My friend, she was in her early 20s. Um, her, her cousin, she was like 14. My, my, my younger brother, I think he was like 16, you know, just four young people out having a good time. And, um, full day. At this time, it was nighttime. So we're all driving home, you know. We had made it back from uh, from Eureka, and we're back in the city. And um, lo and behold, we got pulled over. And as an African American, you already know that feeling. Even back then, I knew that feeling when I saw those lights in the back of me. And we just all kind of looked at each other and in the car. And we got nervous. And I was like, you know, just, just calm down, Jay. Just calm down. You know, and I pulled the car over. And I'll never forget as I'm sitting there with both of my hands on the wheel, because I wanted to make sure that my hands were visible, you know, to comply, you know, just in case something popped off. And I'll never forget the two officers got out of the car. The one officer, for the most part, he was, you know, he was pretty calm and um, he, he, he uh, approached the window and he asked me to roll the window down. And as he was asking me to roll the window down, his partner in the back was just really, really amped up. Roll your window down, sir. Just yelling. I mean, just yelling for no damn reason. I mean, just yelling. So again, I'm just, I'm just trying to remain calm. So I roll my window down. And of course, the one officer, he asked for my my, my driver's license, he asked for, you know, registration, proof of, proof of insurance, and so on and so forth. And, you know, and I, I calmly told the officer that this was a rental car, and I asked permission if I could go into my glove compartment and show him the rental agreement, and he said, yes, you could. And so, you know, that's what I did. Then he asked me, um, I, I need you to get out of the car. So I got out of the car and he made my brother get out of the car. He made my female friend and her younger cousin to get out of the car. And we had to stand around the car. Now, this is supposed to be a routine traffic stop because apparently he was alleging that I was, I don't know, five or six miles over the speed limit. And I probably was, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was like, I was going maybe 46 in a 40 mile per hour zone or something like that. Not that much. Okay, fine. And I was like, okay, cool, whatever. You know, just, just give me my ticket. And I just want to be on my way. So he asked to um, search the car. And I'm like, you know, really? You, you need to search our car? Again, 
we're just young people. We just want to get home. We want to get home safely. So I allowed him to search the car. They searched through the trunk. They searched the back seat. They searched the front seat. They searched the glove compartment. They served the little, they searched the little part, you know, where there's like a, an ashtray and you can keep the little extra, extra things, you know, up front with you. Searched the whole car. Nothing. Again, it was a rental car. And while the officer was, you know, trying to talk to me and ask me some more questions, again, his partner in the back, standing in the back of him, he's yelling and ranting. Answer the question, sir. Now, of course, I'm actually answering the question. I'm complying. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to him calmly, intelligently. You know, we're just conversing back and forth. But his partner was super amped up. And my brother, and I know you're probably watching this, and I love you, but my brother was, you know, kind of, he was, he was a bit of a hothead and, you know, being a mouthy teenager, he was kind of saying some stuff under his breath. And, and I was just look, giving my brother like dirty looks like, will you shut up? Because you're about to put all of our lives in danger. And, you know, so he was, you know, but he was a teenager, so God bless him. But, um, it was just, it was just a really, really scary experience. And as a matter of fact, this cop's partner was yelling and acting such a fool that even his, even the, the calm cop had to turn around and look at him. And as a matter of fact, we all looked at him like, dude, what are you doing? Will you just calm down? You know, because I think for the most part, thank God there was one cop that had a cool head, but the other cop, he was grabbing his gun. I mean, he was just ready. You could tell he just wanted to shoot somebody that night. And it was literally by the grace of God that none of us got hurt. None of us were, were shot. None of us were killed. None of us were, were beaten or anything like that. And we all got back into our car, into the car. And um, we were just very quiet on the way home. You know, I dropped the girls off. I dropped my brother off. And I'll never forget just feeling, I don't know, I just felt so, so, so violated that a routine traffic stop, well, supposedly a routine traffic stop, turned into an all out frisk. Pat down. Searched the car, searched the trunk, and then I was given a speeding ticket. Ladies and gentlemen, I was profiled. I was racially profiled. I was just guilty because I was black. Driving while black in America is an offense. Now, is it on the books? No, it's not on the books, but it's definitely an offense. Um, and that's pretty much where we are as African-Americans. We've just had such, <laughs> this has been a real rough two past two weeks for us. We've had to deal with three major blows to our culture. We had to deal with the death of Ahmaud Avery, black man jogging, hunted down like a dog, shot and killed in the street by two rednecks that decided to make a citizen's arrest based on a lie claiming that he was uh, some uh, burglary suspect. And then we jumped from that to a woman in Central Park, Central Park Karen, <laughs> basically weaponizing the fact that she's a white woman, lying saying that she was being attacked by a black man simply because he asked her to put her dog on a leash because he was a bird watcher. Now, this is this is a man that, to my knowledge, sits on uh, sits on the board of, of bird watchers in New York. He's a well-educated black man, a Harvard graduate. Very intelligent, well-spoken, highly educated sensible, decent human being and American citizen. But of course, that lady didn't see his resume. She just saw that he was a black man. So what did she do? She defaulted to her white woman tears. 
knowing full well that in this country, if you yell that a black man is attacking you, especially if you're a white woman, that's a weapon. She could have gotten that man killed. And while she's on the phone, ginning up all of this fake hysteria with this phony phone call. And, and, and I mean, and she's got the dog and damn near strangling her dog. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, oh my goodness. I, I'm, I'm, my life is being threatened by, by a black man, an African-American man. All of these buzzwords. And thank God that man put that on film. We jump from that to probably the most horrendous act of all. The most devastating, most disgusting, horrendous act that I have ever in my life witnessed. And that was the vicious murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. This man lying on the concrete, handcuffed, legs held by three other officers, while the one officer had his knee in his neck, strangling him. This happened for 10 minutes. Bystanders are begging him Please, literally begging him, please take your knee off, his, off of his neck. The man, George, was pleading for his life for nine minutes. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I need some water. Please. Take your knee off of my neck. Gasping for air. Nose bleeding. Saliva running out of his mouth. Eyes bucking out of his head. At one point, he even called for his mother. Please help me. I cannot breathe. I want some water. Just take... Just take your knee off of my neck. He couldn't breathe. He couldn't breathe. And this bastard refused to let him up. I've never in my life, I've never in my life witnessed anything like that. I made myself watch that. I made myself watch that video because I needed to watch that video. Y'all needed to watch that video. We cannot do this anymore. We cannot do this anymore. This has got to stop. George Floyd cannot be just another hashtag. We just can't make another t-shirt. We've got to do more. We've got to truly, truly get involved in the process. This has been a very, very difficult week for me. Y'all, I'm for real. I didn't even want to do this video right now. And I kept praying and praying. I did not want to do this video. I knew that I had to do this video. You know, I was just planning on doing just another week. You know, doing my snack review videos. I was even planning on doing a Cooking with Jay video. You know, just, but I just, I wasn't in the mood. I wasn't in the mood.
I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm pissed off. Yes, they are definitely protesting in the streets of Minneapolis as they should. And God bless each and every last one of those protesters. And I pray and plead safety over all of their lives. But we have got to do something. So what I'm asking all of you to do. There's a telephone number. There's a hotline that I would like each and every one, last one of you to call. And the telephone number is 1-612-324-4499. That's one area code 612-324-4499. It's a hotline that you can call that will put you in direct contact with officials that have enough power to arrest and convict all of these officers. I need murder convictions for all four of those officers. What I want you guys to do is to call that number and just flood them. Now, I don't have a huge platform here. You know, I'm averaging, what, about 600 plus subscribers. And if you are a subscriber of mine, I'm begging and pleading with you. Please call that number. Let's, let's continue. Let's continue to keep the pressure on this situation. Because I will not be satisfied until we get murder convictions for all of those officers that killed George Floyd. Please call that telephone number. Thank you.